This is Jeremy Lawson, Strength and Conditioning Coach at Marin Catholic High School. And we're going to be talking about the science of speed and what it really is that makes one athlete run faster than another. And we're going over this because over time there's been a lot of theory about speed training that's influenced our training techniques. And it seems as though in a way we've really kind of guessed what we think it is that can make one athlete run faster than another. But now over time, and really in about roughly the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot more research on speed training that's helped us out. And one of the main exercise scientists that has done this is Peter Wayne. And if you're a coach, I really highly recommend that you look him up, go over his research, because it can really help any type of speed training philosophies. So let's go ahead now and get into what we're discussing. We will be watching a high school level 100 meter sprint. As we play this clip, Think about what the determining factors are that you think makes one athlete run faster than another athlete. When we watch an athlete run faster than another, we usually think that one must be moving their legs and or arms quicker. Or maybe we just think that one must have better sprinting form. And it makes sense that we think of these simplified reasons because it's all our eyes can see. Our eyes, though, can't see what's happening deep within the complex physiology of the body. But now science is helping us out and showing us that mass-specific force appears to be the highest determining factor of running speed that we have learned thus far. So what is this exactly? Mass specific force is the amount of force that can be generated into the ground in the limited amount of time the foot is in contact with the ground in relation to the athlete's body weight. So if that seems kind of confusing, we're going to go ahead now and slow the clip down and we're going to talk about how physics gets into the equation. And we're going to look first here at Newton's third law of motion, which is for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And this is going to help us understand how an athlete can run faster. So as we watch the winner of the race run, we know that he is generating a high amount of force into the ground with each foot contact. This force will then be equally generated back up from the ground through the entire chain of his body, thus propelling his body forward and then increasing his stride length. So it's safe to say that stride length is a product of mass specific force by propelling the body through the air for a greater distance. So now what about stride rate? Well there's two parts to that. As we watch here and see as the winner generates more force into the ground through his foot, his foot will come off the ground quicker because as we stated earlier, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So naturally if his feet are spending less time on the ground, his stride rate will increase. But there's also another part of stride rate, and that is swing time, which is the time the foot is off the ground and the leg is repositioning for the next foot contact. And research has shown that swing time does not appear to be a significant factor in determining faster running speeds. And this is the part that is difficult for people to understand or try to accept but research has shown swing times to be very similar between an athlete that is significantly faster than another athlete. But the faster athlete is still generating significantly higher amounts of force into the ground than the slower athlete. So the reason for this can be explained by what we said about the winner increasing his stride length for mass specific force. As his stride length increases, remember, he is being propelled through the air for a greater distance. So naturally his feet are in the air for a longer amount of time which will make it difficult for his swing time to improve consistently as he runs faster from improvements in mass specific force. And the more it looks like the energy used to reposition the limb by bringing the foot under the hip and the knee up which is hip flexion occurs to increase the storage of available energy in the limb, which is not as powerful a movement as the sudden release of this stored energy through the limb and into the ground, which is hip extension.
And a simple analogy to describe this is that hip flexion is like the baseball pitcher's windup and hip extension is then the baseball pitcher's pitch and the pitch is obviously more powerful than the windup. So this brings us to a couple of coaching points. First, too often coaches have focused on high knee drills and instructed athletes to pick the knees up when the knee action is really swinging action and a wind up of elastic energy storage. It seems that the knee will only raise to a height that is optimal to store the most elastic energy in the limb as quickly as possible before it extends and produces its highest level of mass specific force into the ground. Therefore the drills and coaching points we make to pick the knees up appear to be ineffective. Instead, athletes should do drills and be coached to concentrate on pushing through the ground using hip extension and allow the natural motor controlled repositioning of the limbs to happen on its own as it already does with every stride. Another important point is to talk about arm action. The arms of the human body are used to counterbalance leg action during walking, jogging and sprinting. They help the body balance during movement by giving proprioceptive feedback and helping maintain a balanced equilibrium. While efficient arm action needs to be coached during sprinting, we need to understand that different people will have different ways of moving their arms and too often we spend too much time coaching what we think is the perfect way to move the arms during sprinting. For example, Athletes are often coached to never cross their bodies with their arms. While it is obvious in this clip and with almost all athletes that crossing the body with the arms is a natural energy conserving pattern. So what type of training will help increase mass specific force? Well first we know we have to spend a lot of time in the weight room getting our athletes as strong as possible with a high emphasis on the posterior chain. There is a wide assortment of exercises we use to strengthen our athletes for faster running speeds. But there are two exercises that we put the highest emphasis on. First is the trap bar deadlift. There is probably no exercise that will recruit a higher amount of total body muscle fiber than the deadlift, especially through the posterior chain. It is also one of the most natural movements the human body can perform. The next exercise is the one leg squat with the rear foot elevated. This exercise will recruit high levels of hamstring and glute musculature while putting the athlete in a very athletic position that will quickly show important strength deficiencies. We also know that in sprinting and most athletic movement, athletes are on one foot the majority of the time. Now once we gain this strength, we are then going to apply it to training the nervous system for sprinting. And the first thing that we'll do is resisted sprint work. With this, we are now forcing our athletes to generate higher amounts of force into the ground than usual. And the next phase we'll go through is unresisted sprint work. And now we're training the entire body and its nervous system to go through sprinting full speed and applying the new motor control and strength gained from the weight room into sprinting. Now it's important to state that even though there is an incorrect way to sprint, which we will correct, we also know there are a lot of correct ways for different people to sprint. And sometimes as coaches we get too caught up trying to make athletes look good, thinking that we can give them the perfect sprinting form. When really, we need to allow athletes to sprint in a way in which they can generate as much force into the ground as they can possible so that they can sprint as fast as they can possible. Now I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you're able to take some of the ideas and apply it to your speed training philosophies. And remember, as coaches, we owe it to our athletes to learn as much as we can about the strength and conditioning field.